My guest on now that's running for uh, state rep in House District 43B, uh, Justice Whitethorn. Good to have you here. Thank you. Uh, it's good you, to be back. Yeah. Now, you've been on the show before. I had you on three times before. Yes. Um, actually, I think it was four times. But yeah. Okay. Four times? It was fun. You <laughs> only gave fun. me 15 minutes the first... Uh, oh, first time, that yeah, was it. Right. I, wonder, I wonder how that happened. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but... You know, we talked a lot about your experience in the welfare system. All right. And uh, it was fascinating videos. As a matter of fact, if you want to go watch those videos, uh, go to youtube.com, Speechless MN, or do a search, White Thorn Speechless, and those should come up and you'd be able to see them. But yeah. I just very surprising information about the welfare system, how it's run. You did a great job of explaining it. Um, so now you're running for state representative. Yes, yes, I am. You know, somehow or another, I think it's all uh, your fault. But uh, <laughs> oh, really, my fault? Huh? Yeah. Well, I <laughs> everybody <know> I <laughs> blames me for everything. So I got strong shoulders. I'll, I'll take it. Good, good. Of course, most. Yeah. <laughs> well, I. Uh, what happened was I, I came on your show and just kind of give a recap about about the content that was in each one of those shows. Um, I would. Uh, my father was a Salvation Army officer, so I was raised uh, doing some type of ministry uh -huh. to poor people, always around poor people. And it became a lifestyle for me. And after I got out of the Marine Corps in 96 or so, I uh, put myself through undergraduate school, working mm -hmm. third shift at a hospital. But what I really wanted to do was get back and help poor people. Mm -hmm. I became a national consultant. Uh, traveled around the country, and I was really flattered. People actually paid to hear my opinion on poverty in America. Uh -huh. uh, but after I uh, had the privilege of meeting my beautiful wife and having children, I want to settle down instead of traveling all over the country, so I started working in the welfare department. And I saw what I really thought was a fraud. It turns out that it wasn't fraud. It's all perfectly legal. But I came on your show to talk about the things that I had saw that I just I just couldn't believe. I was just just galled about what was happening, and uh, I tried to report the organizations to um, to everybody that I knew. The Department of Human Services. I called the mayor's office. I called the governor's office, and it turns out that uh, it it wasn't actually illegal. And then I came on your show and I told everyone all the uh, silly just games that were going and. From there, uh, some members of the Republican Party uh, saw me on the show, and they, they asked me if I would consider running for, for public office. And I thought, you know what, <clears throat> I'm afraid of the intrusive government. You know, somebody's got to do something. And I consider this uh, another call to duty, and uh, I'm serving my family. I'm, I want to make sure I do the right thing for my family and my community. And... Just like uh, going back to the Marine Corps again, we kind of owe it to our servicemen who are overseas putting their lives on the line to take care of the country back here. Mm -hmm. And so it's for them as well. And um, that's how it all started. Well, speaking of family, uh, we have your family here. <laughs> so why don't you come up and stand behind your dad and uh, we'll adjust the camera so that, uh, you can all be in introduced. Uh, Hey, and I, I see you have some of your kids on the uh, campaign trail there. I do, <laughs> yes. Uh, they actually With the White Thorn t-shirts. Really enjoyed their White Thorn t-shirts, yes. Okay. Well, so why don't you introduce everybody here, Okay. starting well, we, with your wife. <laughs> this is my wife, Blea. Um, I'm uh, blessed. Uh, the Lord has blessed me with a beautiful wife whom I love dearly. Yeah. And the little girl here reaching for me, it's Sarah. And all, all, right. all of my little girls have been daddy's little girls. And yeah, hi, I baby. bet. Yeah, okay, I need to pick her up. <laughs> okay. So that she's happy. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so Sarah's my youngest. She's two. And then this is Mimai. And uh, my wife is Hmong, and we give the uh, two older girls Hmong names. So okay. Mimai means little pretty. Yes. That's kind of like saying cutie pie. And this is my son, Maverick. And uh, he's quite a wrestler. The tall one in the back. Yeah. Okay. And this is my son, Bryce. He's also a wrestler. And yeah. Gashua is my oldest. She's 12 years old, and she also wrestles. In fact, she's a state champion. Oh, wow. And uh, Gashua, uh, her name means uh, the beautiful sound of the rain. Absolutely. You know? And uh, this Fantastic. one, the, the one with blonde hair, his name is Miles. Miles. 
He hasn't right. started wrestling yet, at least not competitively, but when we're in the living room, he likes to grab a hold of everyone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I bet. It's kind of a family thing there. Now, they're all watching themselves on yeah. TV right now. <laughs> That's yeah. good. And so, well, thanks for, have, for, for stepping up here and uh, uh, being on the show. We're going to do a special segment with just the kids after the show where they get to run the the do the interviews and run the show so yeah. they're looking forward to yeah. that yes they are yeah. okay all right well, super uh we got a video now of um uh, of the, them wrestling right yes yeah okay so let's uh watch that video It's coming here someplace. <laughs> All right, why don't you bring it back to me until uh, you get it figured out there. Obviously, we're going to have to edit this out, uh, <laughs> part out of the show. Yeah, it's hard to do but on But they'll figure it TV, out here. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it, uh, it takes a lot. Okay, here's the wrestling thing. Now, who is this? That's Bryce. <clears throat> this is at the Min USA State Championship. That's Maverick. Oh, Maverick's getting ready to pin a guy. He does. Yes, the. They all use uh, a technique called the cradle ride, and that's my daughter, Gashua, and she's pinning them. They all pin with a cradle. Uh-huh. Um, we used to call it the Augsburg cradle because that's where they learned it from, but now because all my kids are using it, people are calling it the white thorn cradle. And you can see more there, YouTube. Yeah. yeah. So, well... You're teaching your kids to wrestle, so obviously you've been involved in wrestling. Yes, in, yes. In the past. Uh, well, I was a youth wrestling coach uh, at Augsburg Wrestling Academy. A lot of people don't know that uh, uh, Augsburg College is quite a powerhouse yes, in wrestling. Uh, I know that. We run <laughs> 11 national championships, and then I, I ran their youth wrestling program for a few years. And then mm -hmm. I coach youth wrestling at North St. Paul. And, oh, okay. And that... Uh, that's been really a, a great joy, great blessing, and their program, you know, needed some work. And I first came as a parent, and just signed my kids up. And their coaches needed some extra help, and uh, some people in the community asked me if I would take over, so I did. And so if uh, Chris Sloan is watching, you know, thanks Chris for all your help. He's a great wrestling dad, and mm. uh, people have been really, really. It, it's really quite a privilege to be able to get to know everybody. And uh, North St. Paul um, really turned their wrestling program around, and they had four state champions and a, even a national champion now. And I, to my knowledge, that's never been done in the history of North St. Paul youth wrestling. Wow. So A national champion came out of there. Yeah. Wow, that's, that's yeah. pretty impressive. Yeah, they're all great kids. They're all great kids. I'm thinking, just thinking about it, I'm getting really happy about it. And uh, I, I live in Oakdale, and okay. I'm actually pretty close to uh, Tartan School. So my children are in the Tartan School District, and they have a, a great youth wrestling program as well. And Steve Jackson, who ran that for 20-some years, is actually retiring this year. So uh, hopefully they, they're going to have a difficult time filling his shoes, but I'm sure that they'll find someone. Mm -hmm. And uh, we also uh, wrestle over there uh, in Oakdale as well, but... We really needed, somebody was needed for the North St. Paul program. Okay. And so that's how I, I got over there. Got over but there. I'm uh, retiring from that now. I not Now that I'm on the campaign trail, I don't have the time. No, it takes a lot of time. We used to wrestle nine months out of the year. And uh, no, I can't, can't do that anymore. <laughs> okay. So. so your kids are making a little bit of a sacrifice here too. Yeah. And are they, I've. They've been in some parades with you too. <laughs> I, yes, they have. They're they're very very cute. That we went yeah. to a couple of parades. Um, and the one that they really enjoyed was the White Bear Avenue parade, and it was uh -huh. quite a lot of walking. They carried on buckets of candy. Uh huh. And uh, my smallest one was uh, Mimai. She she was passing out the candy, and we had to keep 
looking back to make sure that we didn't lose her. Here I am with, I, I'm trying to meet people, and I'm, I'm passionate about literature, I'm shaking hands, and I have six children <laughs> scattered <laughs> throughout, uh, walking up and down the street, and so it was hard for me to keep track of all of them. But I'm very happy to say that I ended up with the same number of children at the end of the parade <laughs> that yeah. I had at the beginning yeah. of the parade. Well, yeah, you would have paid a big price. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Otherwise, yeah. but I mean, where you live in Oakdale, you're really close to Maplewood, and you're not far from North St. Paul. Right. Well, uh, kind of real close with. I live on blocks from each of them. Yeah, I am actually. I'm real close. From, um, I live on 25th Street, mm -hmm. which is in between Granada and um, Century. Yeah, Century or Division or Geneva, depending or, uh, on... 120. Which, or 120, <laughs> depending on what side of the road you're at and how far north you are. And how long the, you've lived in the community. <laughs> right, right. So I'm, I'm really close. So you just go uh, south on Geneva, as soon as you pass the railroad tracks, the first left hand is 25th, follow that, take the first right, and that's Gershwin, and then you uh, go around the corner, and that's 25th Street, so that's where I'm at. So. Yeah. Uh, you also have some U.S. Marine Corps experience? I did. You know, when I was a little boy, I had a, a great uncle, Everett, who raised my father and his siblings. And so my grandfather died young. And they, they were raised during the Great Depression. So my great uncle, Everett, uh, took care of the family. And he was a veteran. Mm -hmm. And my, my family would speak of Uncle Everett and, and just hushed. Uh, admiration and, and mm -hmm. reverence and so when I was a little boy I knew when I grow up I'm going to be a veteran mm -hmm. and uh, one of my uh, relatives his cousin actually marched in a Bataan death march which is mm -hmm. uh, in the Philippines the only marine regiment in the history of the Marine Corps to surrender uh, because a, a, an army general Douglas MacArthur ordered the surrender well I joined the Marine Corps I had the privilege to serve in the Philippines and so um, it was nice to be there and I, I saw Corregidor which is where they surrendered and then after the Philippines, I was in uh, 2nd Battalion, 4th Marines, which was the actual Marine Regiment that served mm -hmm. in the Philippines. So it was quite um, surreal and nostalgic for me, and uh, I, I loved my time in the Marine Corps. At the time, I wanted to re-enlist um, Newt Gingrich and um, Bill Clinton were kind of having a tiff and they shut the government down. Right. So I wasn't able to re-enlist during that time. Okay. Uh, they told me that uh, I had six um, trips uh, to the battalion aid station, which was sick bay, for the same problem in a 12-month period, so they weren't going to let me re-enlist any me. Hmm. Um, that means, and they didn't know that I knew this, but if you can't re-enlist because of a medical uh, problem, then you you're supposed to get a medical discharge. Okay. So they were kind of, you know, staring me down, and I, I tried to call their bluff, <laughs> uh -huh. and, I, and I said, okay, well, either let me reenlist or get a medical discharge. And then they they actually uh, did give me a medical discharge, which. Um, you were disappointed. <laughs> yeah. Well. Yeah. Ex to, except you go into the future, and it's not. To a be fair, at twenty some years ago, and it was because we were at bad back, and and it does still bother me today. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and it doesn't help that I've gained 60 pounds since then, <laughs> but, but yes, um, but I, I do. Yeah, I know that experience. <laughs> <laughs> I do look back. I loved my time in the Marine Corps. I love the Marine Corps. Um, and I do wish uh, I, that I was still in at least mm -hmm. many times. Uh, of course, when it's really cold outside <laughs> and I'm in, in a comfortable, warm bed, I am grateful for my comfortable, warm bed. Yeah. But I, I do actually um, uh, have very fond memories, and, and I do miss the Marine Corps very okay. much. Um, well, I really have gotten... Well, I've, I've known you for... I don't know, 10 years, 12 yeah, years, 15? Yeah, actually it was before I got married, so it's been more than 15 right. years now. Yeah. And I met you at the uh, National Coalition of Free Men. Uh, or um, Four Men. Four Men Now, four men. Is right. what, as okay. it's called. Okay. But. Uh, yeah, uh, men's rights and father's rights, uh, even before I was a father, they were important to me. And I saw, while I was in the Marine Corps, there were uh, many men that would go overseas and they'd be, you know, you know, fighting or uh, potential that uh, they might lose their lives and then they would get a letter from uh, their wife and telling them that they're leaving them. And, uh, and then a lot of these guys, of course, the only thing holding them together, they're under 
terrible stress as right. it is. And the only thing holding them together was the thought that they're going to make it back home and see their wife and children. And some of these guys would go, they would snap. And, you know, I've always been a, a big guy. And so I remember I was ordered to guard one of the Marines that so we suspected was going to either kill himself and kill everybody else. Uh, his name was Dennis. And, you know, I got to know him very well. I had to go everywhere that he was going, even follow him when, when he made a head call, when he mm -hmm. uh, used the restroom. Sure. Uh, head call is the Marine Corps terminology. And, you know, there was no, there's nothing he could do. Uh, and he wasn't the only one. I saw a lot of men who were railroaded and the, the system was, you know, designed to protect uh, people and especially pr to protect women. No one wants to, to hurt women. Right. No one wants to harm women. Right. But sometimes in the, the overzealousness of the legislation, uh, it, it can create some um, unforeseen consequences. And a lot of these men were just living a, a terrible, terrible night where, and there's no recourse for them. Well, and uh, when I ran for state rep, uh, which is a little bit different area than you are now, uh, word, word got out, but I, I was getting calls from men, uh, mm -hmm. military men, mm -hmm. uh, who wouldn't, you're in military combat and you can't be sued at that time and you got to be taken off the field of battle, but, right. at, and, and it's got to, it, it's got to meet your military time schedule. Yeah. And the courts here in Minnesota weren't allowing that to happen. Yeah, that's... And you're losing your kids, you're losing your house, and you don't even get to show up to court. Right. And, it, and it's devastating. And you're going out there, why am I fighting this war? For what, for what rights am I fighting for? And that's not just Minnesota, unfortunately. No, it's not. Right. And, but the way that but you said that... But this happened to somebody in Maplewood, and he lost his house. And he's, yeah, and, and he's not the only one. And, and fortunately, he got a good attorney, and he won his house back. Yeah. Uh, the way you said that, I want to kind of clarify something. I'm okay. not sure everyone... All right, it. sure. Um, what's happening then is that military personnel are being sent overseas to fight in a war. Uh, while they're being uh, overseas... Um, the courts back home are scheduling court dates for them because uh, th they may be in the process of a divorce or uh, maybe child custody has, has um, gotten involved or something mm -hmm. like that. Uh, and the United States military is not going to release them from active duty in for Afghanistan or Iraq for to come back lawsuit. to Minnesota right. for, for a lawsuit. Right. So because they don't be appear in court in the United States, the judge then can say, hey, he didn't appear in court, and now a it's ruling is made. a default judgment. A default judgment, exactly. Which and is so he loses his children um, he, and, and loses his home and anything else that uh, could be the at The other state. person asked for. Anything else that the other person asked for, right. So then, But, but I, I just got to add in here, that's against the law for a judge to do right. that. It is against the law, and they do it anyway. Yes, and this is and the what is the judge? What's thing? the penalty for the judge who willfully, knowingly does this? There's nothing. Well, technically, yes, but it, it, practically speaking, no. Right. And and that's that's really the shame. There's, there is discipline, but nobody's doing it. Right. There's a, it's a difference between technically speaking and practically speaking. And you know, I'm I'm very fortunate that uh, you know my wife and I have a, a great marriage, and we've certainly had our share of ups and downs. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I just thank God that I, I haven't had to experience uh, some of the things that these, you know, brave men <laughs> uh, who are good fathers and good husbands uh, have had to go through. Mm -hmm. And I'm uh, trying to earn my uh, doctorate in psychology. Uh -huh. And so I'm doing my internship, and I've done internships at different places. But one of the places I did at was uh, North Side or East Side Neighborhood Services in Minneapolis. And so I would provide counseling usually to men who are court-ordered for anger management. Uh -huh. And they would normally be court-ordered for ma anger management in a, some sort of a domestic violence dispute. And I would say, you know, it's anybody's guess, you know, maybe 50% of these men, uh, these guys, are some of them are real, real bad guys. And it's scary to right. think that there are men like that out there on and the there streets. Yeah, yes, right. and there's, there's definitely, and I, I counsel these guys, I do the best that I can. And as I'm getting to know some of them, I'm, I just thank God that my children are safe as I'm do, providing counseling. Mm -hmm. But then uh, some of them are 
good men, at least, they, or they're either great actors. That's always a possibility. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I get the impression that they're very good men who have been railroaded by the system. Now, there's always the possibility that they're just good actors and they're fooling me. Mm -hmm. um, but there's really little recourse for, for these men. Uh, they're kind of like, uh, they're, they're afraid. And I, as a counselor, have to assume that they do indeed have uh, a an anger management problem. Right. And so what's happening is they're being intimidated in courts and, and threatened with if you if you don't plead if you don't plea bargain you're going to go to jail for the rest of your life. Right. Uh, and a lot of these men, and in fact, the majority, I would say, ninety percent of the ones there are men living in poverty or at or around or below the poverty threshold. Mm -hmm. So they they can't afford lawyers and they don't trust their you know, publicly mm -hmm. appointed lawyers, and mm -hmm. and they're afraid, mm -hmm. so they plea bargain, uh -huh. and and then they uh, come to anger management, and then they tell me, I don't really have an anger management problem. I just plea bargain because I was afraid that I would go sure. to jail. Well, as a counselor, I can't. You can't deal with I, that. I, no, I mean, I have to say. This is what the court ordered. This you got a problem, so therefore I got to deal with that. Right. The then the difficulty that I have is. If he's telling me the truth and he doesn't have an anger management problem, then anything that I do under the guise of therapy really isn't therapy. It's more like brainwashing. Right. If, and, but I have to assume that he does have an anger management problem. Mm -hmm. it, it wouldn't work otherwise. So I, I counsel them, if you don't have an anger management problem, then you don't need to be in anger management. Mm -hmm. And so you can go. But mm -hmm. they're not going to go because if they if they do, then their parole officer or probation officer, whatever the case may be, will write that they are non-compliant, and then they're they're going back to jail. Mm -hmm. And so it really puts the counselors in a very difficult uh, situation. Um, and, and many of the counselors have their own bias, and some of them, uh, some of the counselors have bias that may border on prejudice, and um, the. A lot of the men uh, come to me because most of the counselors are women. They feel that they're being mistreated by the mm -hmm. female counselors. Uh, you know, I can't accept that from them either. I, right. I have to assume that you know there's there's just some backlash from there. But it's th there are a lot of extenuating circumstances that I wish that I had the power to look into more, and I wish that. Um, the men had more resources available to them. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I have a job to do. Uh, hopefully I'm doing a, a good job. Um, well, um, isn't part of that program through the anger management is is uh, these guys have to admit to their anger, otherwise um, they don't pass the class? I exactly. You know? and, and that's really... And so you've been, you know... Falsely accused. So in order for the organizations to um, be referred these men, the, the men have to pay for the therapy right. themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, the organizations must be on a pre uh, preferred provider list. In order for the uh, organization to be on a preferred provider list uh, that the government has, they have to give the government what the government wants. <clears throat> uh, from a professional um, perspective, um, I and the other counselors can only provide counseling, can only provide therapy. However, my supervisor uh, needs to make sure that she continues to be on the, the government preferred provider list. Mm -hmm. And so she wants to make sure that we essentially get a confession out of e each one of them. Right. Um, yes. And I have to explain that as a professional, I cannot coerce or or or, or, or beat or uh, a confession out of, out of these or men. Wouldn't that be abusive in that, itself? Right, that would be abuse in itself. Um, but the organizations are, you know, if they don't get the confession, if the men don't admit that they are um, in need of, of that they are uh, a wife abusers or whatever it is that mm -hmm. they're accused of, <clears throat> then they are found non-compliant by the program. Mm -hmm. And then even if they go through their 18 weeks and pay all the, their fees for it, right. they could still be given a report of non-compliance and end up going back to jail anyway. Well, and the pressure on them, as I've had personal experience in this, yeah, I went through a divorce. If you don't get ordered into anger management, it's rare. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had one anger management guy just yelling and screaming because I wouldn't admit 
Mm -hmm. to what I was accused of doing. I never admitted to it. I will never admit to it because I didn't do it, but the courts don't care. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we had a fake trial. Couldn't, couldn't get a defense attorney on these things, and you lose your kids. And this, so this anger management teacher just out there pounding, standing up over me, mm -hmm. throwing his finger down. You tell the truth. You are angry. And he's just screaming and yelling and at me. And this was in therapy? Yeah. Okay, yeah, that, I don't know. Uh, I mean, they pulled me out of the class. Right. I'm just talking, you know, and telling them, no, I, I didn't do it. And There's a difference it's between just, It's just weird. Therapy. So they pulled me out and they just started yelling and screaming at me. Uh, and unfortunately... And then I'm, kicked me out of the class. <laughs> unfortunately, just, I'm sad to say that I have observed counselors behaving in that way. And the problem is that... If, why, do, why do they have to behave that way? There's no reason for them to, is well, there? There is, there is There's actually. A, okay. Uh, you have to make up, as a, a counselor in that situation, you have to decide what is it that constitutes being a good counselor. Is it appeasing the system, and that is getting a confession? Uh huh. And, and if you, if the more uh, individuals you can get a confession out of, the more you're going to. Uh, be helping your organization stay on that preferred provider mm -hmm. list. Mm -hmm. So there's there's a sometimes a difference between uh, what some people consider being a good counselor. Mm -hmm. uh, I consider being a good counselor uh, providing the therapy that the client wants because in order for it to be real therapy, it has to be client directed. Yeah. It has to be the client is here because the client wants to be here, and the the client will name the goal for the client's therapy. Okay. If there's anyone else who has a goal for the client's therapy, then either that goal needs to be thrown out, anyone else's right. goal needs to right. be thrown out, or the, the counselor can take it in, but by doing so, it's no longer therapy. Right. It's, it's more like coercion yeah. or brainwashing. Yeah. And the counselors are kind of, you know, if you want to get your, your degree, you've got to get your hours in, you've got to do this. If you want to get paid, you've got to yeah. do this. So, well, here's the bottom line in this. I mean, you're showing you have a tremendous amount of experience in counseling because you've got your master's going for your doctorate. Uh, you also have a bachelor's degree in intercultural studies. Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, master's degree was in organizational leadership. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, you do consulting right now. Yes, yeah, and that's also one of those things that have taken a backseat to the campaign. But yeah, Whitethorn Consulting is the name of my okay. organization, and uh, that's the one that I did uh, when I was traveling around the country as a national consultant on poverty okay. as well. Yeah, and so you've done a lot of public spe speaking on these issues of poverty, and uh, know the social services inside and out, as you can see on the other videos. Uh, but as a candidate. Uh, what are you seeing, what are you hearing from the people wh as far as what their concerns are? Um, so as I'm going out and talking to the people, you know, I'll introduce myself and, and um, give them my card, and then I'll ask, are there any issues that are most important to you in this coming election? And the ones, you know, some of them say, oh, you know, I don't know, I'm not into politics. But the ones that uh, start talking, uh, there's a common theme in, of invasive government. Um, it seems as if people are afraid of their own government. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that uh, comes up is the um, it's the anti-bullying bill, right? And so parents are concerned about that. Um, another thing that uh, comes up is people are afraid that government spending is absolutely out of control. So there's the ninety million dollar. Uh, Senate office building that was approved. Right. Well, when you say the parent, what are they raising as concerns about the anti-bullying bill? Well, uh, the anti-bullying bill uh, apparently was it was championed by an organization called Out Front America, right. which is uh, really advocates for the uh, and then out LGBT. Front Minnesota. Yeah, yeah. Uh, right. And uh, they're strong advocates for the LGBT community. And what's happening is that the individuals I'm talking to are really leery about the motivations that are behind this. And so if you look at the, the bill, you know, there are certainly loopholes in the bill. Mm -hmm. Now, as a, so I do a systems engineering uh, in organizational consulting. And uh, when you look at a systems, you have to look at the holes in the system and ask yourself, is that uh, there on purpose or by accident. Right. And if the 
answer is it's an it's there by accident then you need to get rid of it in order to make a good system mm -hmm. uh, when you try to get rid of it if anybody stands in opposition to you getting rid of it then they may th they must think that the hole is there for a good reason right and <clears throat> so some people uh, apparently think that the loopholes here are in for a good reason and the thing that uh, can so what is the loophole here well the, the one thing that comes up the most is uh, children can now be disciplined without parents' knowledge and consent. Right. And this, this is, is indeed, see, yeah, and, and this is very scary. And I, as I see what happens um, in, the, in the welfare organization and in my experience with counseling, the, the way that the government uses this, uh, this is very, very scary. And so to think that the, this loophole will not be abused I, I I am very skeptical of that. I mean, that's sort of like when somebody tells you the check is in the mail, or you know, I'm I'm with the IRS. This won't take but a minute. You know, right? Uh, yeah. I don't know. I don't know about that. So that's something that scares me as a parent of six children. You know, four of my children are in school, and two of my children are, are young. And you know, I would like to know that if my ch uh, children are going to be added to some sort of database saying that they are they have done something and that uh, justifies uh, labeling them as a bully I would like to know that I would like to advocate for my children I would like to be informed of that mm -hmm. um, but that doesn't necessarily have to be the case now so that's that's the thing that um, so comes parents up are, most are, are getting about pushed out of the raising their kids and this is where I, it seems as if if you, you take this in with the other things that the individuals are complaining about, uh, it seems as if, and some people are very, very angry, it's almost as if the government is, is mocking the people, as if the government is daring the people to do something about it. Uh, taxes have gone up an enormous amount, was it? Uh, the, the, the largest tax increase in the history of Minnesota is that we've just experienced right. in this last session. And while that's happening, our property values are going down, you know, our gas prices are going up, our food prices are going up, people are making less money than they were, uh, and people are thinking, now, hold on a second, this is just plain disrespectful. You, the government has approved a $90 million Senate office building during the time when uh, the economy is really not what it should be. Right. The taxes are going up while people's property values are going down and people's income levels are going down. And people are thinking the government has no respect for us. The government is out of control. And many people are literally afraid. And uh, some people are just extremely angry. And they're not f sure who to point the finger at. Right. Uh, some people just blame all the politicians. Uh, one thing that I hear is there seems to be an increasing divide between the poor people and the middle class. A lot of the individuals in middle class are angry that their individuals in poverty are being taken care of as well as they are. Mm -hmm. uh, I was out, uh, where was it now, somewhere, I think it was 40th Street. I introduced myself to someone and uh, asked if there are any issues that are important. And, and they said, you know, you, you go down a couple blocks here and there's Section 8 housing. Now, I want to say that, you know, I have had a, a you know, heart for individuals in poverty sure, for, for years and all of my life. And, but uh, a lot of the individuals, and I mean, three or four of them just on this, uh, probably within about 10 houses, mm -hmm. all pointed to Section 8 housing. And, and they're angry that the individuals in Section 8 housing are being so well taken care of when uh, they are not on Section 8 housing and, and they think that they have to work really, really hard for, for less. Mm -hmm. And what I'm c very concerned about is that there's just a huge divide between the, the people, the, the people are becoming angry at each other, pointing fingers at each other. Um, you know, sh certainly we need to help all the poor people in, in Minnesota, um, but we need to do it in a way that's not going to divide us against each other. Um, this, this really, you know, breaks my heart, breaks my heart. Well, I know you talked about the $90 million office building, and I've been down at the Capitol a lot, mm -hmm. and in the Senate offices and the House of Representatives. <clears throat> this is just a space management issue because there is a lot of space in that Capitol building, right. and they can redesign with all the other 
uh, offices and buildings down around the area, there's a bunch of empty space they could have used. And to build a $90 million is just, it just was not and is not necessary. Mm -hmm. um, it's a boondoggle, to say the least. Um, as much coming up on the issue of roads and light rail? Uh, yes. So I was just passing them by, I was uh, by Tartan High School, and I knocked on a door and I asked, uh, what are the issues most important to you? Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a couple, and they were very unhappy about, uh, number one, the roads were not uh, being as main as well as they thought that they should and that mm -hmm. this winter you know the potholes were particularly bad and you know, they have a long commute and um, but the thing that really irritated them was light rail why is so much money being appropriated or misappropriated depending on your perspective right. to light rail when our roads aren't being taken care of. I mean, mm -hmm. what is the percentage of the population that is taking mm -hmm. care of, of light rail? Mm -hmm. Now, before I moved to, I moved to Oakdale three years ago. Prior to that, I lived in Frogtown. Mm -hmm. And I lived on Sherburn Avenue, which is one block north of University, where, mm -hmm. where the light rail went in. Uh -huh. And my neighbors and I attended the neighborhood association meetings, and uh, we talked to our politicians. And I'm unaware of a single one of us that wanted light rail to be in there. And we were screaming as loud as we knew, as mm -hmm. loud as we uh, could, and, and talking to anybody that we needed to talk to. And the things that we were concerned about was the parking is going to disappear. Yeah. People are going to move and start parking in front of our homes. Uh, the businesses are going to be run out. Uh, rent is going to go up. And well, all of those well, things actually I mean, happen. Here's the biggest thing. It's the St. Paul Light Rail, it's ineffective. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's that's the big thing. It just hurts traffic. It's a slow train. I, I take the Hiawatha, the, the, the blue line, and mm -hmm. I've taken the green line, and the difference between the two is night and day. Right. And uh, it was just, it's just a whole waste of money. The buses would have been great. Just leave the buses, and mm -hmm. that would have been fine. But the light rail to St. Paul from Minneapolis, really bad. Bad stuff. We're, we're, we've got about less than two minutes left here. Mm -hmm. So, what, what do you what do you want to say? Why why should people vote for you, Justice? Well, you know they're going to have to make up their mind. All mm -hmm. right, that's what I really want to tell everyone. You know, if you're happy with the way things are right now, then you can keep on going with the way things are right now. But I think that there's plenty for us to be unhappy about. Mm -hmm. And I say that, you know, government owes us more respect than we have seen. Mm -hmm. We need to put the families back in charge of the education. We need to put our children first. We need better representation. If we're going to be standing out screaming, we don't want light rail and we do want better roads, somebody right. needs to be paying attention to that. Mm -hmm. We need to fix our economy and we're not going to be... That's, Taxing the people is not going to help the people uh, rise above their circumstances. And I just think that the government is just plain been disrespectful to us. And uh, that seems to be the case in what everybody else is telling me as well. So I agree with the feedback that I'm receiving is, you know what, uh, somebody needs to rein in this out of control uh, overspending, overregulation in this invasive government that's happening just for our sake and for our children's sake. Well, and here's, here's what I've gotten from this, and here's, here's my takeaway. Uh, Justice, you're uh, an honorable man. You, you got a great family. Uh, you're knowledgeable. You can dig down deep into the issues. And you would add a dimension that is not there in the legislature not coming from the area you're representing, that's not in that legislature that says, uh, that can add to the discussion and can give input and thoughtful input. It is not coming from your area. Mm -hmm. And you're the type of person that could. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and you could immediately step in there and be a key player in the legislature with all your experience, uh, knowing the social welfare situation, knowing the business. Uh, Knowing counseling, uh, you 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 just be a fantastic candidate and a fantastic representative. Well, thank you. You know, I I have to agree with you on that one. You're a very <laughs> smart man. Yeah. Well, wow. <laughs> well, you're not the first person that's told me that, but no. <laughs>
-hmm. Well, uh, so you're going to be doing some door knocking and out on the out on the road, and uh, yeah. we got about a month and a half left here yep. before election. So people in Maplewood, Oakdale, North St. Paul, Justice Whitethorn, that's the candidate, uh, and I I challenge you find out about him and uh, uh, because he'd be great. All right, we're done with the show, folks. Uh, uh, you want somebody that's going to stand up for your liberties. And if you don't stand up for other people's liberties, who's going to stand up for yours? Justice Whitethorn will. Um, Leon Lilly has not been doing that. And also, good men don't do nothing. This is a good man. He's doing something. God bless. Have a great week.